run election time. Candidates, they just can't do enough. They'll promise you anything. They'll give you a long list of proposals. They'll even come around with TV crews in tow and throw back a, a shot and a beer. I will promise you this, that if we have not gotten our troops out by the time I am president, it is the first thing I will do. I will get our troops home. We will bring an end to this war. You can take that to the bank. that you could do early pertaining to executive orders. Uh, one of them is to shut down Guantanamo Bay. Another is to uh, change uh, interrogation methods that are used by U.S. troops. Are those things that you plan to take early action on? Yes. But if those same candidates are taking millions of dollars in contributions from the PACs, and the lobbyists. Ask yourself, who are they going to be toasting once the election's over? You offer no change. You have the same foreign policy. You want more troops in Afghanistan. You're not talking about only going to war with a declaration. You don't want to deal with the monetary financial crisis in this country. You want to keep, you know, the system together for the benefit of the banks and the big corporations and the politicians. And what kind of change do you have on social policy? Do you care about sick people using marijuana? I mean, have you come out for that? He doesn't want change. He wants the status quo. And quite frankly, I am not expecting the troops, regardless of whether Obama wins, that they'll be home in 16 months. And that is just pure political talk. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Today, in his press conference, the president made clear that he believes the law does allow him to make this commitment on his own. Listen to this for a moment, if you would. I'm not a Supreme Court justice, so I'm not, I'm not going to... Uh, 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 put, put my constitutional law professor hat on here. Do I think that uh, our actions in any way violate the War Powers Resolution? The answer is no. So I don't even have to get to the constitutional question. Sir, protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. So I don't even have to get to the constitutional question. Simply, sir, what's your reaction? <laughs> That's a horrible statement. He should get to the Constitution. He doesn't have to be a constitutional lawyer. You take an oath of office to obey the Constitution. If we don't know what it says, how can we take the oath? Uh, the Constitution is very clear. You don't go to war without a declaration. Uh, you sit down with your attorneys and tell you what you have to do, but obviously the President of the United States has to do what's in the best interest of the United States to protect us. Well, this idea of going and talking to attorneys totally baffles me. Why don't we just open up the Constitution and read it? And the Constitution is the law of the land, and we don't have to be uh, the constitutional lawyers to understand that. We don't need lawyers to tell us what to do and not to do, because we shouldn't be in office if we don't understand what the Constitution says. It's plain and simple. I agree now with Ron Paul more than I did in 2008, and, and we have a choice, and I think this is the choice that's going to happen to us. You can't live in this middle ground with our Constitution. You can't. You either embrace the Constitution or shed the Constitution. And Ron Paul is the closest to our founders out of anyone up there. Our economy seemingly on the brink of collapse. High unemployment sticking around. New foreclosures jumped 20%. All out from the debt crisis. Seven million jobs lost. The nation's debt keeps surging. Change has come to America. The concept of TARP, I was willing to go along with it. I think there is need for economic stimulus. I signed a letter with the uh, Democrat. Act. 
Where are the people that say all of this stuff is socialism? Government's too big. The role of government ought to be for the protection of liberty, not for the intrusion in economic affairs. We've spent too much, we tax too much, we borrow too much. It's bankrupting this country. I've been talking about these problems for a long, long time. Now we're bankrupt and we have to decide which way we're going to go. Imagine for a moment, for a moment that somewhere in the middle of Texas, there was a large foreign military base, say Chinese or Russian. Imagine that thousands of armed foreign troops were constantly patrolling American streets in military vehicles. Imagine they were here under the auspices of keeping us safe or promoting democracy or protecting their strategic interests. Imagine that they operated outside of U.S. law, that the Constitution did not apply to them. Imagine that every now and then they made mistakes or acted on bad information and accidentally killed or terrorized innocent Americans, including women and children, most of the time with little or no repercussions or consequences. Imagine that they set up checkpoints on our soil and routinely searched and ransacked entire neighborhoods of homes. Imagine if Americans were fearful of these foreign troops and overwhelmingly thought America would be better off without their presence. Imagine if some Americans were so angry about them being in Texas that they actually joined together to fight them off in defense of our soil and sovereignty because leadership and government refused or were unable to do so. Imagine that those Americans were labeled terrorists or insurgents for their defensive actions and routinely killed or captured or tortured by the foreign troops on our land. Imagine that the occupier's attitude was that if they just killed enough Americans, the resistance would stop. But instead, for every American killed, ten more would take up arms against them, resulting in perpetual bloodshed. Imagine if most of the citizens of the foreign land also wanted these troops to return home. Imagine if they elected a leader who promised to bring them home and put an end to this horror. Imagine if that leader changed his mind and went into office. The reality is that our military presence on foreign soil is as offensive to the people that live there as armed Chinese troops would be if they were stationed in Texas. Shutting down military bases and ceasing to deal with other nations with threats and violence is not isolationism. It is the opposite. Opening ourselves up to friendship, honest trade, and diplomacy is the foreign policy of peace and prosperity. It is the only foreign policy that will not bankrupt us in the short order, and our current actions most definitely will. I share the disappointment of the American people in the foreign policy rhetoric coming from the administration. The sad thing is, our foreign policy will change eventually, as Rome did, when all budgetary and monetary tricks to fund it are exhausted. Madam Speaker, I have a few questions for my colleagues. What if our foreign policy of the past century is deeply flawed and has not served our national security interests? What if we wake up one day and realize that the terrorist threat is a predictable consequence of our meddling in the affairs of others and has nothing to do with us being free and prosperous? What if propping up repressive regimes in the Middle East endangers both the United States and Israel? What if occupying countries like Iraq and Afghanistan and bombing Pakistan is directly related to the hatred directed toward us? What if someday it dawns on us that losing over 5,000 American military personnel in the Middle East since 9-11 is not a fair trade-off for the loss of nearly 3,000 American citizens, no matter how many Iraqi, Pakistani, and Afghan people are killed or displaced? What if we finally decide that torture, even if called enhanced interrogation technique, is self-destructive and produces no useful information and that contracting it out to a third world nation is just as evil? What if it is finally realized that war and military spending is always destructive to the economy? What if all wartime spending is paid for through the deceitful and evil process of inflating and borrowing? What if we finally see that wartime conditions always undermine personal liberty? 
What if conservatives who preach small government wake up and realize that our interventionist foreign policy provides the greatest incentive to expand the government? What if conservatives understood once again that their only logical position is to reject military intervention and managing an empire throughout the world? What if the American people woke up and understood that the official reasons for going to war are almost always based on lies and promoted by war propaganda in order to serve special interests? What if we as a nation came to realize that the quest for empire eventually destroys all great nations? What if Obama has no intention of leaving Iraq? What if a military draft is being planned for for the wars that will spread if our foreign policy is not changed? What if the American people learn the truth? That our foreign policy has nothing to do with national security. That it never changes from one administration to the next. What if war and preparation for war is a racket serving the special interests? What if President Obama is completely wrong about Afghanistan and turns out worse than Iraq and Vietnam put together? What if Christianity actually teaches peace and not preventive wars of aggression? What if diplomacy is found to be superior to bombs and bribes in protecting America? What happens if my concerns are completely unfounded? Nothing. But what happens if my concerns are justified and ignored? Nothing good. And I yield back the balance of my time. The one thing Donald Trump has ever been right about is that he's unelectable. We are in the business of kicking candidates out of the race. Just Ron Paul is going to destroy this party. Paul is doing very well out in Iowa, and I don't think that's going to thrill a lot of the Republican establishment. Right now, live, right next to the bus behind us, Ron Paul is speaking, and seven of the candidates are here today. We have live pictures of Ron Paul, but you know what? We're talking about Sarah Palin, and we're talking about Rick Perry, the two people not in the race yet, Drew. And guess what, Paul? If you get video of Sarah Palin or get a soundbite from her, bring that back to us. You can hold the Ron Paul stuff. <laughs> we have a top tier. It is Mitt Romney, Rick Perry, and Michelle Bachman. We have a new top tier, and it's Perry, Mitt Romney, and Bachman. There's now a top tier in this race, at least for now, of Romney, Perry, and Bachman. I mean, I think that's fair to say. Really fair to say? You're not forgetting, I don't know, anyone, say, an ideologically consistent 12-term congressman who came within less than 200 votes of winning the straw poll? Isn't anyone going to give that gentleman a little love? There's a top tier now of, of, of Bachman and Perry and Romney, and, you know, we haven't mentioned, and we should, Thank you. We haven't mentioned, and we should, Rick Santorum, who did really surprisingly well for the amount of money and resources he had. Rick Santorum? He didn't get half of what Ron Paul got. He lost to the guy who lost so bad he dropped out of the race. Santorum? We're looking at Mitt Romney, who continues to be the front runner, but we have Rick Perry as well, and now Michelle Bachman. Let's not count out John Huntsman, though. What? <laughs> John Huntsman? Huntsman got 69 votes. <laughs> this pretending Ron Paul doesn't exist for some reason has been going on for weeks. A new Gallup survey showing Rick Perry running second to Mitt Romney, knocking down Iowa favorite Michelle Bachman to fourth. Behind who? Fourth behind who? How did Libertarian Ron Paul become the 13th floor in a hotel? Why? What's wrong with he is Tea Party patient? Zero. All that small government grassroots business, he planted that grass. These other folks, they're just moral majorities in a tri-cornered hat. Ron Paul's the real deal, and Fox News should love this guy. Oh, here's what you're tweeting me at Jerry Willis FBN. The only real candidate is Ron Paul. Come on, Jerry, you know this by now. Everyone else is for endless wars and big government. And Frank writes, he is not getting the attention he should. However, I do not think he will be the last one standing. And Jim says this, I believe he is. His plans for our government are basic, simple, and easy to implement. No story there for the media. Question tonight, is Ron Paul being ignored by the media? Log on to jerrywillis.com. Take the poll on the right-hand side of your screen. I'll share the results at the end of tonight's show. 
Earlier this hour, we debated whether presidential candidate Ron Paul is getting enough attention. He basically tied with Michelle Bachman in this weekend's straw poll, but she got all the news coverage, not to mention his Texas colleague Rick Perry stealing all the headlines. So we asked on JerryWillis.com, is Ron Paul being ignored by the media? 97% of you said yes, he is. 3% said no. And listen to this. We had voters from 26 different countries voting in that poll. Years have finally caught up with the candidate. Paul's message hasn't changed, but the urgency of what he's saying has increased dramatically. And it seems like this time more people may be listening. He came within an eyelash of finishing first in the Iowa straw poll, less than 200 votes behind Michelle Bachman out of nearly 17,000 votes cast. Again, a fact that was largely overlooked by the mainstream media. Michelle Bachman has no chance of being the next president of the United States. Maybe Ron Paul should be. Here's the question. Is Ron Paul the only grown-up running for president on the Republican side? Jarrett writes, yes. The real question is, are Americans ready to put on their big boy pants and accept some of the truths Ron Paul has been telling us for decades? We're broke. Our wars are a racket. The Fed is destroying our currency. The Congress is ripping us off. The threat of terrorism has been exaggerated. We're never going to agree on everything, so let's focus on agreeing on one thing, that we should all be free. Andy writes, the only grown-up, I don't know. What I do know is he gets little or no media coverage even after he practically tied Michelle Bachman in the Ames straw poll, and that's her home turf. Tony writes, not only is Dr. Paul the only grown-up in the race, he's the only candidate who is mature enough to tell us the truth, even if it's unpleasant. After listening to him, I'm reminded that there are still good leaders out there who actually want us to be free and live in peace. Refreshing to hear an honest, unscripted, heartfelt candidate who speaks passionately and truthfully about the issues that matter to us all. Tommy writes from North Carolina on Facebook, Ron Paul is not the only adult in the Republican race, just the only honest one. And Tony in Topeka writes, he might not be the only adult, but I can't think of another. By the way, Jack, I think the real question should be, why is the media not covering Congressman Paul? John Stewart did an amazing piece on his Daily Show last night. Sometimes I wonder whose side the media is on. Iran does not have an air force that can come here, just like we did in Iraq, build up the war propaganda. There was no al-Qaeda in Iraq, and they have nuclear weapons, and we had to go in. I'm sure you supported that war as well. Okay. It's time we quit this. It's time. It's trillions of dollars we're spending on these wars. <laughs> What's with the smirk and the eye roll? The guy gives it the crowd goes nuts, and you do one of these. There goes crazy Uncle Ron, babbling about the unsustainability of multiple wars. Be bad about this. In people where countries that you put sanctions on, you are more likely to fight them. I say a policy of peace is free trade, stay out of their internal business, don't get involved in these wars, and just bring our troops home. Congressman Paul in the civilian courts. Could you please tell Congressman Paul why he's wrong? Well, because simply terrorists who commit acts against United States citizens, people who are from foreign countries who do that, do not have any right on our const under our Constitution to Miranda rights. We've also seen that Guantanamo Bay has yielded significant information. In fact, we've learned that that led to the capture and the killing of bin Laden. This is a tool that we need to have in order to be able to prosecute the new type of war, the new type of warfare, and the new type of terrorists that this country is dealing with. With. Seconds, Congressman Paul. Well, I think she turns our rule of law on its head. She says that the terrorists don't deserve protection under our courts, but therefore a judgment has to be made. They're ruled a terrorist. Who rules them a terrorist? I thought our courts recognized that you had to be tried, and we've, we've done this. And we've brought individuals back from, uh, from Pakistan and other places. We've given them a trial in this country, over 300, or at least near 300. We've tried and put them in prison. So this idea that we, we have to turn on the head and reject the rule of law, we already are at the point where this administration, please let me finish, I have to say, this administration, this administration 
this administration already has accepted the principle that when you assume somebody is a terrorist, they can be targeted for assassination, even American citizens. That affects all of us eventually. You don't want to translate our rule of law into a rule of mob rule. Senator Santorum. Our country has defaulted three different times. They promised at one time during the Civil War to pay in gold. They refused to in the 30s. They promised to pay in gold. They refused to. And then in 1971, they promised to pay foreigners in gold. We defaulted and we stuck it to them. So once again, we're going to default. We're defaulting every single day. That's what your prices are doing. Prices go up. They're defaulting on your money. So we need to look at the Federal Reserve System. by active duty military personnel by the candidate. Herman Cain, $6,223. Now remember, these, these numbers are uh, coming from reports that, that may be, uh, uh, if anything, overstating these, these numbers at this point. Uh, but Mitt Romney, not even coming up to, to Cain there for active duty military contributions, 5,000. Michelle Bachman, bit of a late start this round, okay. $2,550. Newt Gingrich, whose campaign is imploding. I don't know if that was by accident there. $1,025. Uh, Palenti, all of $250 from active duty military. Rick Santorum, $250 also. Gary Johnson, sadly, none for his position. Total there of those uh, other candidates, so to speak. $15,398. Sure sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Well, there's one other candidate who you might have noticed. Well, I don't know if you're watching the mainstream media. You, you might not have noticed that he was omitted from that list. Let's see, how much did Ron Paul get in this last quarter from active duty military? Oh my gosh, $36,739.79. No surprise, actually, that this was the case far outstripping all other Republican presidential candidates put together, as was the case uh, four years ago. But let's see, let's compare this to, who's, who's the other guy running for president in 2012? Oh yeah, $28,833.99 for the president himself, including all the donations from the Marines, the Air Force, the Navy, the, the Army, yeah, whatever that other branch is. To the Commander-in-Chief, Ron Paul is their choice. But let's go, let's take a look at the numbers from 2007 here. Just a second, comparing Ron Paul, John McCain, Mitt Romney, Rudy Giuliani, Mike Huckabee, and Fred Thompson, there's a little flash, uh, flashback. Total from the entire campaign back four years ago, again, Ron Paul, until, until the end of the primary season, Ron Paul had more campaign contributions from active duty service members than all other primary candidates put together, including Barack Obama back then. If I had to be a betting woman and I had to be idealistic, I'd really like to see Ron Paul get the nomination for the Republican Party. Whoa! I really think he's a sound traditional conservative, yeah. Um, it's a surprising um, come of things, and I really think he really sticks to the Constitution and really stands for what conservatives believe in. Okay. Republican Congressman Ron Paul would get the nomination. The name Ron Paul is the most searched term on the blogging website Technorati. His campaign website gets more hits by far than any other Republican candidate. And he has more friends than any other Republican candidate on the social networking website MySpace. In the real world, another thing, he is stuck firmly among the lesser known candidates. So welcome, Congressman. And Congressman, according to my calculation and my rough notes, we didn't hear from you until, you didn't get a question until 9.35. Do you think you're being, you're being treated fairly like by the debates? Cell phone connection. Well, it will be because of conspiracy if he doesn't do well. Well, I'm, I don't, I don't know what it, what it's going to be, but I mean, Ron Paul enjoys the support of the military. I mean, the common rank and file military, he has the most donations to his campaign. And where do you get that? And that's to me. Where do you that's get that? Back? Back. Where did you the same way, that? The same, the same way you get that. I know what I read. One, one, may I say one thing about Ron Paul? I find it odd for me to be a Ron Paul supporter, but he lost to Michelle Bachman. 
by nine tenths of one percentage point in a straw poll that doesn't suppose isn't supposed to pick winners, but it's supposed to tell us which way the wind is blowing. That's as good as a win. So we had a tie for first. But where are, where is he on the morning shows this morning? Where are all the stories? analyzing what it means that Ron Paul essentially tied for first place at Ames. You sound like a pro forma 1930s isolationist. No, I'm not, no, I'm not an isolationist. I am a non-interventionist because the founders of this country that, that I listened to carefully mm -hmm. were very much, they were not protectionists at all. They were free traders. They wanted trade and travel In fact, and that's friendship. The point. You, say, you say you're the true Republican when it comes right. to... The winner of the straw poll this year, Congressman Okay. Congressman Congressman Ron Paul gets 30%. Former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney, former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney gets 23%. And as you can see, there are a number of candidates who got 6, 5, 4, 3 several of them very prominent. Winner of this year's CPAC straw poll is now... Okay. Well... The winner of this year's CPAC straw poll is Texas Congressman Ron Paul. In the end, he was the winner. Probably not the reaction he was hoping for when you name a favorite to run for the White House. Mixed applause and boos as uh, Ron Paul was announced over the weekend. The fiery Texas Republican, uh, no doubt unfazed by the reaction. He's live with me now uh, from Capitol Hill. Winner of that straw poll for the second year in a row. How you doing, sir? Congressman I'm doing fine. Paul. Welcome I'm back. I'm doing here. fine. Thank you. Uh, so who, who was in the um, who was in the audience booing you? Did you get a name on the? <laughs> did you get an ID on those people? No, I wasn't there, so uh, I didn't watch that uh, little ceremony at the end. But it tells you that uh, there's no the, the people aren't unanimous on this cause of liberty. You know, I am very determined that liberty is the issue, and some people like to be taken care of more so than demanding their freedoms. During a, during a live introduction to Congressman Ron Paul on Tuesday, America's Newsroom incorrectly aired a clip. Uh, it was clearly a mistake. We used the wrong videotape. You've seen this with the online polls, where Ron Paul starts winning, so they pull him off the poll. That's probably happened six, seven, eight times I know of in Yahoo polls and other major polls. When I went to the YouTube page, I started watching the Dr. Paul video, and while I was doing that, I was looking at his statistics. Now, I've got many videos up on there, so I've watched statistics for over a year now. And that's when I began to see that something wasn't quite right here. I began to smell a rat. I mean, look at this. It had been rated by 1,596 people, 1,245 left comments, favorited 652 times, and the number of views was only 213. How is that possible? The answer is it's not. And I thought, well, let's give YouTube a little break here. Give them a chance to straighten things out. So I went to bed and got up eight hours later. And eight hours later, the numbers had gone up. It had been rated by 4,229 people, 3,446 left comments, favorited 1,798 times, 
but the number of views was still only 213. 16 hours later, I went back and checked it out, and Ron Paul's video had gone up again. 6,326 ratings, 6,163 comments, favored it 2,763 times, and the number of views was still locked in at 213. What's wrong with this picture? Is Ron Paul's video being kept off the front page? Well, 37 hours later, I went back and checked it out again, and the numbers had jumped up. Ratings, 8,580. 10,851 people left comments. Favored it 3,583 times, and the number of views was up to 301,452. Suddenly, it had a huge jump. How could that have happened, YouTube? Unless you did it on purpose. I mean, look at this, the views suddenly jumped from 213 to 301,452. There was only one reason this could happen, and that YouTube wanted to keep Ron Paul's video off the front page. I thought, well, I wonder if they've got it on there now. And, oh, look, suddenly he's number two on the most viewed page of all people looking at all the videos that day. Only a pretty girl beat him on that one. Uh, and when it came to news and politics, most viewed today page, Ron Paul was number one. years or so, um, we put on this big charade and think that we're going to change things by voting for someone who sounds correct or who the media shoves in our face. Oops, that was my bad caller. I cut you off. Welcome back. There is agitation in the world of conservative blogs beneath the headline, Life is Really Not Fair. Redstate.com recently announced it was banning bloggers from posting Ron Paul related comments. Effective immediately, new users may not shill for Ron Paul in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Not in comments, not in diaries, nada. Ron Paul is a big deal online, no? Yeah, I'm hearing from his supporters in my in my email account. And then you stop Ron Paul. <laughs> this is, of course, this is the reason that you're even putting him on the show is to spike your ratings because we know <laughs> we know that every time we write about him, the hits to our website. No, it's not a joke. I mean, it's amazing that every time we write about him, the hits to the Washington Post website go up. So who won? A poll of GOP insiders says Mitt Romney didn't do anything to hurt his frontrunner status last night, and that's sort of what his yep. goal was, mm -hmm. obviously, to you know, do no harm. 51% saying he was the biggest winner. But Congresswoman Michelle Bachman also scored some big points as well, coming in second when people were asked who won 21%. Uh, she was actually the only other candidate in double digits. Well, CNN's put up just some videotape that's completely misleading and say it's one thing when it's really something else. Um, it seems like both sides play this game, and I think a lot of people in America are just kind of sick of the game. All right, so yesterday we had our debate wrap-up, and the general consensus seems to be that things went all right for Ron Paul, and he was treated fairly. But sadly, CNN appears to be afraid of using its own polls for its own post-game analysis. When reporting post-debate, they instead use data from a National Journal poll given to political insiders. Data taken from five other major poll sources post-debate showed Dr. Paul at 31.07% at Fox News, 83% at CNBC, 87% at WePolls.com, Vortex Effect. May, might have been a little biased there with the, the, the audience, 93.31%. But even at CNN's own poll, 78%. Okay, so let's be fair. The online polls can be skewed like any other form of polling, but here's the skewing that CNN came up with. There you go. Romney at 51%, down to Paul at zero. How did they get away with this? They didn't invent the numbers, as they might as well have. Instead, they reported on a National Journal online poll that had all of 54 votes. And according to the Baltimore Sun, it was reported that Ron Paul clearly won audience favor in New Hampshire. An analysis of audience reaction shows Paul was applauded twice as much as any other candidate on stage. Throughout the two-hour debate, Paul was applauded 11 times. Romney, Bachman, and former Minnesota Governor Tim Pawlenty were each applauded five times. 
Former House Speaker Newt Gingrich and businessman Herman Cain were each applauded four times. Senator of Pennsylvania, Senator Rick Santorum, was applauded the least amount of times three. Again, zero percent. Really? Why are they so scared of Ron Paul? Well, the ruling class of this country, the Fortune 100, the private Federal Reserve, have amassed their wealth through monopoly. They've amassed their wealth through uh, insider, anti-capitalist, crony systems. And now their system is basically imploding because of their uh, corrupt policies and activities and looting. And here's Ron Paul, who's called it every step of the way with incredible precision, who has the constitutional answers to get our country back on the right track, and the system is scared to death. They're like vampires faced with a cross or holy water or a truckload of garlic. They are in absolute panic mode because they've looked at the numbers and they know Ron Paul is the real front runner in the 2012 election. And they know that if he continues to catch on, even their electronic voting machines won't be able to stop a landslide. And if they did, the public would see right through it. So they have to convince you that he's unelectable. They have to sell you on the idea that, oh, I like Ron Paul, but he's not available. You know, he can't win. The fact that Ron Paul is the true front runner and is popular across the political spectrum, and major political analysts have had to admit that only Ron Paul can effectively beat Barack Obama. That's why the system is scared of him. And that illustrates how awake people are that Ron Paul is the most popular, and if this was a fair game and wasn't rigged, would be our next president. This is an endorsement for fair coverage, and there is no question the congressman isn't getting it. Consider the fact that during Saturday's CBS debate in South Carolina, seven minutes and 45 seconds worth of time was allotted to Rick Perry. Five minutes and 45 seconds worth of time to Rick Santorum, who was polling at nearly the last place among presidential contenders. In comparison, Ron Paul got a whopping 89 seconds worth of time. Does that seem like fair coverage? And that is Reality Check. I have gotten a ton of email today from people saying, look, Ron Paul finished 152 votes behind Michelle Bachman of the Ames Trouble, basically a dead heat. Why aren't we giving him his due? Ron Paul is not going to be President of the United States. If, if our views you know, keep growing in uh, popularity as they are. It's a real threat to the establishment. So the establishment is well protected in many of those individuals that control the five major networks. Let's talk about Ron Paul because he just won another straw poll in California and he keeps winning straw polls, but I guess if history is any gauge, it doesn't really mean very much. Anyone get the sense Ron Paul like crazy Uncle Ron. I, I, listen, I, I've, I've done a show on why conservatives shouldn't vote for Ron Paul. Poll. Romney leads New Hampshire. Huntsman third. Perry fourth. Now, do they know how to count? <laughs> why would they omit <laughs> saying who was in second? second? Well, you know why. Ron Paul. All right, my uh, dumbest thing of the week is uh, Ron Paul. The winner is Ron Paul with 32%. Ron Paul did not win, us. in my opinion, by any... As a matter of fact, I think he lost the debate. I think all of us could make the case for anyone, maybe except with the exception of Ron Paul. <laughs> um, we can make the case that any Republican right now can win this race. Another question about electability. Uh, do you have any, sir? There's always the question as to whether or not <laughs> you are, in fact, viable. What's success for you in this campaign? What's success? Um... What a win is one, one is the That's goal. That's not going to happen. You know, you don't need a majority. You need what he said was an irate, tireless minority willing to start, start the brush fires of freedom in the minds of man. I am gaining recognition in the campaign as a threat to a lot of people. 
It's a threat to the military industrial complex. It's a threat to the bankers, the big corporations who get all the benefit. It's a threat to the people who preach that we have to be in the world and uh, be in all these countries. So I think it's big banks, big money, big corporations, and, and the people who want to be the warmongers. and in his head, in his character, and in his intellect, in what he has done and in what he will become. The Thomas Jefferson of our day, Ron Paul, is one of us. Ron Paul, you served with him. Yep. Uh -huh. Tell me what the guy's like, because I want to tell you, yeah. uh, if you mess with uh, Ron Paul in uh, on television or online, you are going to feel the wrath of some serious followers. I've been, we've been dealing with this the last few weeks at CNBC. We did an online poll after the debate of who won the debate. Ron Paul dominated the debate, and some of my colleagues at CNBC thought that there was something wrong with that. They took the poll down. I want to tell you, my email box thousands and thousands and thousands of email like I haven't seen from any other you know followers of Chris Dodd or Bill Ron Richardson or Joe Biden. Well I'll tell you and you know the interesting thing is that my son was uh, back from uh, school and was telling me about Ron Paul signs all mm -hmm. over the campus as we were driving through Pensacola there was a Ron Paul sign handmade yeah. actually stenciled uh, on every single uh, every single sign that where you could attach something and that's happening all across America and you've got a couple things going here you've got Republicans that don't see any real conservatives out there you've got libertarians that want the government off their back and you also have people on the far left who like his message about uh, about the war about the war mm -hmm. and keeping the government uh, from our phone records and things it's it's it is a fascinating cross current no, what does Republican colleagues in the house think about it uh, truthfully, everybody thinks he, in the House, everybody's thought uh, that he's been crazy for a while. As far as too, too conservative, too libertarian, he is, uh, he's an independent, very independent guy. He doesn't play by the rules. And so the, he's always sort of been off by himself in the Republican caucus uh, going back to 1996 when he came in and he was in before. But then again, you know, he ran as a libertarian uh, against the Republican Party. I suspect he may run as an independent. 
again this year if he doesn't win, which would be really bad news. Well, there's something to him, though, because he's got this really fervent following. And I think it was in the style section of the Washington Post yesterday about his fundraising, which, I mean, he's actually been able to raise some money. He raised as much as John McCain in the third quarter. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, John, when you hear him talk, he's, a, he's an extremely impressive man. I, when I said Republicans thought he was crazy, he's an, he's an extremely impressive man. He's brilliant. He didn't. And he practices his what mind. he practices what he preaches. He doesn't let his daughter, didn't let his children take student loans out from the federal government. He's a doctor that doesn't take Medicare or Medicaid. And I'll tell you why, like like my 19-year-old son, who was not excited about any candidates, was saying, "Man, I went on these websites, and everybody's excited about this guy." Here's a question for you: Could Congressman Ron Paul be President Paul next year? He's the best shot the Republicans have, says my next guest. With me now, Fox News political analyst and my colleague and friend Juan Williams. Juan, it's a pleasure. Looks like you're in the mountains oh, somewhere, but welcome to Freedom Watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm in Salt Lake City. All right, great place, a beautiful town. Has Ron Paul succeeded in changing or moving the political debate after 25 years uh, of oh, being in yeah. public life during this, his third run for the presidency? I say this with amazement, but it's, it's becoming more and more clear that we live in the age of Ron Paul, Judge. I mean, you stop and think about it. Who's the father of the Tea Party? It's Ron Paul. I mean, Ron Paul's the guy who began the conversation about debt, deficit, high taxes, government intrusion. And initially, he was viewed as an extremist, an outsider in terms of the Republican establishment, somebody to be ignored. He's the guy that's from the start raised questions about U.S. involvement overseas in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. He's raised questions about the drug policy. I just heard you talking about that guy getting arrested down in Louisiana and put away for life. He's been saying these things, and the Republican establishment has treated him like he's their loony lo uncle. Oh. Well, now, all of a sudden, guess what? Ron Paul, not only is he the father of the Tea Party that won the majority of the House for Republicans in the 2010 midterms, but he's the father of so much of the discussion about the budget, about the debt ceiling, about taxes right now. This is the age of Ron Paul. All right. Can he translate his having moved the debate into areas that he has been educating the public about for the past 25 years into votes? Stated differently, were you surprised to see that CNN uh, poll two days yeah. after the Republican debate that showed him with having the best shot of all the Republicans, not just those at the debate where you were one of the questioners, but of all the Republicans against President Obama? I was stunned. Again, to me, it's like a revelation, and it's just becoming clearer and clearer about this thing. I keep saying age of Ron Paul. The right. question is, does the big, do the big money people start to give some credibility to someone like Ron Paul when they see the CNN poll and see that he actually is outperforming the Palentis, outperforming the Gingriches, outperforming the Romneys, the Mitch Daniels? That's the question, and I don't know the answer to that yet, but if, in terms of moving the argument, moving the conversation on not only drugs, but Afghanistan, right. personal liberty, the debt, that's all Ron Paul. Well, in the interest of full disclosure, I, I, I'm a senior advisor to Ron Paul, and a lot of people see, they saw Winston Churchill, he was a pariah in his own party, uh, on both, to both parties. He often voted alone in Parliament, and uh, he was ridiculed by the press, but he was right. And if your viewers Google uh, September 10th, 2003, Ron Paul, they will see him before the House Financial Services Committee predicting the housing bubble, describing the morality of, of millions of homeowners losing the value of their homes, of the mortgage lending crisis. All of this was seen in advance. And so how important is that aspect then, the fact that you had to presciently seen a lot of what's going on? Because then the next command is, all right, well, Great. You, you, you could see into the future and predict a lot of this. Touche. <laughs> now we expect you to be the guy to, to, to lead us out. How does he pass, or others even pass muster there? Well, morally, the, the, the problem morally, the British people looked at Chamberlain and Baldwin and they said, hey, if they knew this crisis was coming, why didn't they tell us? And if they didn't know, why did we elect them? And there's the same sentiment today. If, if George Bush knew the housing bubble was coming, and if Obama knew that his uh, stimulus program wasn't going to produce any jobs at all, why didn't he tell us? And if he didn't know, why is he in power? And why not turn to somebody who seems to know? So that's how these sort of things do happen uh, historically.
Educate, please, this panel of experts here, and I say that with quotes around it, Loosely. <laughs> about why this sort of throwing money at the issue, bailing, bailing, bailing out, may be potential, potentially reckless and damaging for the future of this nation's economy. Well, in order to understand that, you have to understand how we got into this mess. We got into this mess by spending too much, borrowing too much, and inflating too much. Government was too big, and we had too many regulations. We had rejected the market economy for decades now. We had rejected the notion of sound money for decades. And we got our, into a mess this way. So what is the proposal? Spend more money, borrow more money, print more money, regulate more so. So it makes no sense whatsoever. So we're going to make the problems much worse. We're doing exactly what we did in the 1930s. We are determined to take a serious recession and turn it into a depression if we don't change our ways. When governments spend money, they spend it in a non-productive manner. And every penny the government spends, they have to take it out of a productive source of money. The money has to come from somewhere. Everybody talks about the money that's going to be spent and how, about, how many wonderful things will happen. But and never say, where does the $825 billion come from? That's the question they have to ask, and they have to find an answer to that to fully understand why what we're doing is absolutely wrong. All right. Okay. Congress, Congress, okay. Let, let me ask you. I mean, I understand where you're coming from here, I think, sort of. You know, but the House is already on fire. And I think no right. matter who, no matter yeah, what I mean, we think how the fire headlines. began, the House is on fire. Our House is on fire. So let's take one industry specifically. Let's take the automotive industry in this country. Are you saying spend no money on the automobile industry in this country, that American automobile manufacturing, let it disappear? Well, I, I think you're cr correct. The house is on fire, and you think you're putting water on it, and I think you're putting kerosene on it. Okay. And uh, that's the big argument. No, you take the car industry. Yes, I think we should put more money into the car industry, but it should come from private sources. It shouldn't come from government, because government will divvy out the money politically. But there are private sources of money. Yeah. If there's anything of value, that it'll be bought up. But you don't, you can't value anything when the government buys up uh, assets that aren't sellable. You buy up <laughs> worthless assets. So there's some worthless assets yeah. in these car companies. So if you want good money to go into car companies, you have to allow real capital to flow into it. So you, yes, you do want that. You just don't want the government to do so, it. So what systemic changes, if you look at tax policy, which alters flow of capital, as you, as you know well, if you look at whether it's a spending or, or any other aspect of the use of money, interest rates, monetary supply, etc. What well, systemic what change would you put in? Would you exploit this opportunity to change the system of capitalism in America for the better? How would you change it? Get rid of the income tax. Get rid of corporate taxes. Get, and, and really lower taxes. But you have to lower spending. Would you add a you consumption tax to make up for that? Would you, would you put a consumption oh, no. tax in? How would you make up for the lost revenue on income tax? I agree with you on income and business tax. I just don't know where you get the revenue elsewhere. And I would argue well, I'm not, I'm, not I'm not interested in getting the revenues. I want to cut spending. But the problem is, is nobody wants to cut the American empire. Even Obama's uh, administration wants to increase spending overseas and increase military spending. As long as you want to run the world empire at a trillion dollars a year, believe me, you cannot solve this problem. And uh, that is where the crux of the matter is. So yes, you have to cut spending along with cutting taxes. So to say, well, let's have a consumption tax, that's just transfer the you know the penalty to new victims but you well, want to get taxes down you want to get rid of regulation you don't want to do what we did after the Enron failure past Sarbanes-Oxley you know by the conservative Republicans that's the fault it's in the thinking that we need so much government mm -hmm. Congressman, are you, are, Congressman are you really saying that, that given the meltdown on Wall Street and some of the craziness that we saw at Citigroup and Merrill and other places that there should be less regulation not more in some cases yeah, we should have more on the Federal Reserve so that we know that we're doing. They're exempt from regulation, as is Treasury. We give Treasury $350 billion, and we don't even know where but, but, they spend but, but, but it. That's Street, the type of regulation you want. But what about on, what on Wall Street? Do you, do you not want to see, on some of these derivative products, do you not want to see there be some kind of regulation in terms sure. of, uh, of what the banks can do? 
Sure, anybody who commits fraud goes to jail, just as they did in Enron. We didn't need Sarbanes-Oxley to prosecute everybody in Enron through, uh, through the laws of, of fraud. If they commit fraud, they go to prison. Just like Madoff, you, you, you know, we had all those regulations, SEC and everything else, and he got by. Did but, 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 it but proves but, SEC but, didn't work. But, Congressman, it's not just fraud in some cases. In some cases, people had very little equity put down and were leveraging things up tremendously. Should there not be regulation about how much equity you effectively have to put in the deal or how yeah. much capital you have to have on your balance sheet? Sure, and if you understand uh, leveraging up equity and, and debt, you have to look at fractional reserve banking. That's where you pyramid debt. Mm. So they're doing exactly what the Federal Reserve does, is they create money out of thin air and they pyramid debt. That's where the bubble comes from. That's why you have to look at monetary policy. Yeah. But you're looking at the symptoms rather than the cause. Hey, mm. Congressman, hang, hang with me for a couple of seconds here. I am extremely limited. And 90% of this conversation that you've been having with Dylan and Carlos has gone way above my head. But your basic theory, let's get government out of nearly everything. Let's swing back to what I do nearly every morning. I drive to work on roads filled with potholes beneath bridges that are crumbling. What's the answer here? Do I go out and try and find six carpenters and some bricklayers and some masons to fix those bridges and bridges, roads and bridges? What, government's got to do it. What, what, what's the deal here? What is your point of view about stuff like that? Basic reconstruction of this country. Okay, I know I can't have my perfect society quickly, but what I would do is quit bombing bridges in Iraq and then paying to rebuild them, and then wasting the money in the rebuilding over there. I would take that money, save it on the deficit, cut the deficit, and spend some on our infrastructure. Okay. That's what I would do, and we could do that. But as long as you do it through debt financing, it's impossible. Ideally, roads and bridges should have been taken care of by our states. It wasn't designed in the Constitution that the federal government would take care of every bridge and every road. But that isn't the worst type of spending. And I think in the interim, we certainly could. We could cut the spending overseas. But we're going to bring ourselves to our knees. We're going to have a dollar crisis. We're doing yeah. exactly what Obama, Osama bin Laden wanted to do, what he did to the Soviets. He's bringing about uh, financial chaos to this country. And we've got to realize that excessive spending that is a problem. It's not that we need more so government so spending. Ask, that to ask, me is foolish. I'm to, I want to ask you the same question I've been asking myself, everybody on the set. I asked Tucker. I asked Pat, I'll ask you. In reality, and forget the, the perfect, your perfect society, mine, or anybody else's. In reality, we're going to lose millions of jobs over the next year or two. In reality, our banks have been mismanaged horribly as a result of both the bankers and the politicians, in my opinion. And we're now dealing with that. What would you do? We, in other words, saying what you don't think should happen has a value to a point. But in reality today, what do you think the American politicians and bankers ought to be doing? I wouldn't pretend that pouring kerosene on the started with I wouldn't. Working. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I want you to start it with I would. Okay, what I would do is allow the liquidation of debt to occur. You want the people to spend more money in buying up assets. You want these assets uh, priced in the marketplace so we know what their values are. That's why that first package of the. But no uh, one in the market uh, will do that. As you know, I, I, then I there's want no that value too. there. That's a good information, then there's no value. Why should you dump that on the well, American taxpayers? That's a strong message agreed. that if it's worthless, you don't dump it on agreed, the taxpayers. That's, that's why looking. our slump is getting worse. What, how do you get this country healthily to, where, to your perfect society, where there's limited taxes and free markets and innovation reigns supreme, and me and Willie are on the beach you know, getting drinks served to us from robots, but that's not where we are today. How do you well, get that? How do you, you, have to have how do you deal with the reality of the problems of this country? Well, the reality is you have to liquidate debt and get rid of the malinvestment. If you don't do that, you can't do it. But what you're doing now is you're working on the destruction of the dollar. There's a pretense that you're going to yeah. improve things, but you're really going to destroy the dollar. And a financial I crisis that we I have today is going to be a dollar crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Paul, I'd like to begin with you. Every debate begins with a specific policy question, but this is a little different. Someone on this stage hopes to be able to take the oath of office 14 months from now, and at the end of that oath are the words, so help me God. When you hear those four words, if you have the opportunity and the privilege to say them, what will come to mind? I think they're very important. Uh, we take, a, those of us who have been in Congress and served in government, we take an oath frequently. We take an oath to uphold the Constitution. 
And that's what we do when we take an oath, uh, when we're sworn in as president. We emphasize this. But I think what that does, it emphasizes it even more so because of the significance and the importance. And it reiterates the fact that we swear to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law. And to, this, uh, to me, this would mean that you're not only saying this you know, in front of a small number of people, not only in front of the nation, but before our God, which means the significance is that much greater. So those of us who have done this before, and I've taken my oath rather seriously, very seriously, and believe that I've done a very good job in upholding the Constitution, and even when sometimes it's difficult, and this to me would send a signal that by saying, so help me God, I really will obey the Constitution and that pledge. I think the uh, issue is obviously very important, and we can charge one side or the other of, of influencing our culture too much. But the goal of government isn't to mold society and mold people. The, the role of government is to preserve liberty so that we as individuals assume the responsibility and our families assume the responsibility. Our, our values should come from our family and from our church. But once, once we say, well, the liberals are doing this because they want this economic interference and we're going to have perfect balance and fairness, they overdo it. But you can do it on both sides. You can say, well, we're going to make people better by having more laws. I think culture is very important. Culture has a reflection on the law, and I think that is very good. But the law can't reflect the morality of the people. If you do that, you have embarked on something where you sacrifice liberty. Once you turn this over to government, when government assumes this role, it can only do that at the sacrifice of liberty. So our goal ought to be to preserve liberty so that we have our religious values and we make our own decisions. If we can make our self-determination for our hereafter and our spiritual life, certainly on our own personal habits and our economic habits and how we spend our money, certainly we should assume that the people can do this. The guidance should come from individuals, from our family, and from our church. You know, the, uh, the early church struggled with this. I mean, Christ came, Christ taught about peace, and uh, Christ was to be the Prince of Peace, uh, and uh, we were to defend that. But early on, the church struggled with this, and uh, St. Augustine came up with the uh, principles of the just war. I believe in them. I think we should follow those from a religious viewpoint, but we have a constitution that is very clear to guide us to try to prevent these wars. And that is that we don't go to war without a declaration. The wars that we have fought since World War II are all illegal, unconstitutional, immoral, and all were unwinnable, and it was tragic. It was tragic because we did it by failing the rule of law, and the tragedy now of these wars of the past 10 years. 10 years, and we have been so complacent, it added $4 trillion to our national debt, uh, 8,500 Americans have been killed in these wars. 44,000 have come home wounded and crippled. Hundreds of thousands are looking for help. And we want to blind ourselves to this. And it isn't in our national defense. It was mischief. It's getting involved where we don't need to be involved. I think it is, a, it, it is an utter tragedy of what's happening. And if you want to talk about a family life, there has to be somebody in this audience that has been the bearer of bad news, either a loved one lost or a loved one crippled. And it's on and on. I had one soldier come to me the other day, and he was, he was so against the wars, and he spent three or four tours over there. And he says, I lost so many buddies, and I don't know why we were there, and there's no signs of progress over there. But he says, now I'm losing my buddies to suicide. The wars destroy the family, undermine the family, as does economic climate. The bad economics and war is two most destructive things to the family, and we ought to concentrate on that, and we can't concentrate on the economics unless you look at the business cycle, why we have inflation, busts, and booms. Otherwise, we will continue on a downhill path. The Bankster's Fraud continues now. So I think we should come together and work together, and I think we can. Well, the Fed is uh, completely out of control. Uh, it, it, it's not under any legal controls that Congress can really enforce. And right now, ultimately, they are more powerful than any emperor has ever been. It's about Democrat-Republican. People who say it is, that's not true. 
This is about right or wrong, up or down. Today, I think uh, it was a, a historic day because we agreed on four major areas. Foreign policy, get the soldiers back, stop being imperialistic. Privacy, deal with the repeal of the, uh, of the Patriot Act. And the third is the national debt. You know, deficits are now used for reckless government adventurism. And the fourth issue is the Federal Reserve is now a government within a government. It is totally out of control. Congress doesn't control it. It's funded by the banks. And we either have constitutional government or we don't. Because, because of this, well, here's the question. Is there anything left for the American people to decide? To vote for uh, a Republican to balance a budget, and they're worse than the Democrats. That's what the people are sick and tired of. You vote for the Democrats to end the war, and they expand the war as much as the Republicans. I'll rephrase it. the question for Ralph. <laughs> Who is the lesser of two bads right now? <laughs> the lesser of two bads is not good enough for the American people. We need the best. The crisis is much bigger than what they even uh, are talking about, because they're not talking about the real crisis, and that is the bankruptcy of the whole country and the destruction of the dollar. And when we're going to bring our troops home and change our foreign policy, I mean, this is, this is much bigger than they think it is. A lot of people are pointing fingers. Who do you say is to blame for the situation right now? Uh, what do you want to go back to the Federal Reserve Act of 1913? <laughs> All wars are fought with inflation, destruction of the money, which is the reason we have unemployment today. $30 million an hour. 24 hours a day we're spending on those two wars. $30 million an hour. I'm trying to get you to understand what the motive was behind the bombing. At the same time, we had been bombing and killing hundreds of thousands of Iraqis for 10 years. Would you be annoyed? If you're not annoyed, you, then there's some problem. Republican Congress member Ron Paul of Texas uh, speaking last night at the Republican presidential debate. Noam Chomsky, your response. I think what he said is completely uncontroversial. We have broken from reality a psychotic nation. Ignorance with a pretense of knowledge replacing wisdom. An epidemic of cronyism. A central bank that deliberately destroys the value of the currency in secrecy, without restraint, without nary a whimper. This is not the kind of government that was designed by our founders of the country. It's not what was written in the Constitution. We've only had an income tax since 1913. But if you want a welfare state, and if you want to police the world and pay for the defense of Japan and Germany, send foreign aid to the Soviet Union, you not only need the income tax, you need the Federal Reserve to print up the money when the deficit uh, is accumulated. So we think the government should be much smaller. During the next decade, the American people will become poorer and less free while they become more dependent on the government for economic security. This country is in the, in, in the middle of a recession for a lot of people. Michigan knows about it. Poor people know about it. The middle class knows about it. Wall Street doesn't know about it. Washington, D.C. doesn't know about it. But it's because of the monetary system and the excessive spending. It's no joke. He is America's last true statesman, and he has actually been saying the same thing for the past 30 years about what our federal government needs to do to serve the people. That is, namely, follow the Constitution. The Federal Reserve credit created during the last eight months has not stimulated economic growth in technology or the industrial section. But a lot of it ended up in the expanding real estate bubble. This too will burst as all bubbles do. How could it be that you knew this on the banking committee in 2003 and nobody else did until after the collapse? I certainly think it's about the most foolish policy any government could ever follow. And it leads to the Korea Wars, the Vietnam Wars, uh, Marines being killed in Beirut, sailors being killed in the Persian Gulf. If we want to go to war and if we should go to war, the Congress should declare it. We don't go to war like, like we did in Vietnam and Korea because the wars never end. They're building up this case like, just like we did in Iraq. Build up the war propaganda. There was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And they had nuclear weapons and we had to go in. I'm sure you supported that war as well. Okay. It's time we quit this. It's time. It's trillions of dollars we're spending on these wars.
Afghanistan, how quickly would you bring as the troops As quick home? as the ships could get there. It really says a lot that the politically aware people in the military, those that are paying attention and engaged in the political process, are supporting someone who advocates an immediate withdrawal. I got twice as much as all the other candidates put together on the Republican side, and even more than Obama got, which tells me that those troops want to come home as well because they know exactly what I'm talking about. My name is Eric Knowles. I'm an Air Force veteran. My name is Jonathan Schaefer. I spent six years in the Navy. Hello, my name is Tony Morick. I served in the Army for eight years. I'm Al Schlegel. I'm an eight-year Air Force veteran. Hi, my name is John Jones, and uh, I'm a U.S. Air Force veteran. Uh, I have a cousin who's in the Marine Corps. He spent 18 months over in Iraq. A war based on a lie. There's, a, there's great reason to have hope for uh, Ron Paul's candidacy, as he's the only veteran on, in the Republican primary right now the only representative in Congress that takes his oath to the Constitution and the rule of law seriously. You sign up for the military and you sign the dotted line. You're there to defend America and the Constitution and Ron Paul is the only person that's been doing that for a while now. I support Ron Paul because I believe he's the only candidate with the fortitude to actually stand by the Constitution. I took an oath to support the defend the Constitution and he is the only elected representative that actually takes his oath seriously. I think he's dead on when he talks about the Federal Reserve System. It's only because the government is able to print money to pay for the war that we're able to stay at war. Um, and that, that act of printing money makes us all poorer. It's been going on and on because we just plain don't mind our own business. That's our problem. During the last campaign, I knew what was happening. You know, they mocked me for my foreign policy and they laughed at my monetary policy. No more. President Obama has 42% of voter support and Representative Ron Paul, 41%. Wow. I see a fantastic movement at the grassroots. This man brings together people of all races, all socioeconomic backgrounds, all political affiliations, because freedom is truth, and truth is power, and we can live and be free in this country if we believe we can. What's appealing about him overall is that he is intellectually honest, and that he have, obviously has a lot of integrity. Ron Paul is at least not a pander, he's sincere. The reason people are worked up about Ron Paul is because they sense that he's genuine, that he's not a sellout, that he's not taking money to uh, espouse certain positions like 99% of other politicians. The one guy in the field agree with him or don't dis uh, agree with him who doesn't go out of his way to regurgitate talking points or change what he believes to fit the audience he's in front of. He served, as you said, 20 years in Congress, but you're not going to take a congressional pension. Right. Uh, as an obstetrician, you never took Medicare or Medicaid for your patients. Never. I personally endorse it. Ron Paul for President of the United States for 2012. A lot of stuff he says makes perfect sense. Mainstream is moving in the direction that I have been talking about for a long time. And everything he has said has been truth. And a lot of stuff Obama has said has been lies. I will promise you this, that if we have not gotten our troops out by the time I am president, it is the first thing I will do. I will get our troops home. We will bring an end to this war. You can take that to the bank. So does that mean you can tell us today that you will not change the 16-month timetable? <laughs> I, I like Ron Paul. I think he's a cut from a different cloth than the rest of those people who are, of course, selling their souls to the corporate interests who back them. I believe that abortion should be safe and legal in this country. I will preserve and protect a woman's right to choose and am devoted and dedicated to honoring my word in that regard. I will be a pro-life president. He came to Austin as a Democrat, and then he ran into uh, Karl Rove, and Karl Rove whispered in his ear, he said, look, you're a good-looking guy, you got your politics, you're kind of conservative. It was easy for him to make the switch. They represent the status quo, and this is what excites so many people now. They're sick of the status quo. Suddenly, a lot of people who love the country and haven't voted precisely because they felt like it would be an insult to the great history of this country to vote for one or the other criminal are so excited at the prospect that wait a minute maybe the country can be saved after all. I do think you should value people who speak from the heart uh, and who tell the truth and you should also value people who honor the vision of your founders and respect the most sublime constitution devised by human intelligence.
We want an America full of principled people. Not people who say one thing and do something else. Say anything to get elected. But who say what they mean, they mean what they say, and they live their lives by those principles. Ron Paul has been consistent for more than 30 years. And he's been absolutely right about the most important issues facing this country today. Which means that when he's elected, we can trust that he'll actually do what he says he's going to do. And that what he does is actually going to work. This country is in a revolution. They're sick and tired of what they're getting, and I happen to be lucky enough to be part of it. Don't get involved in these wars. Just bring our troops home. There is absolutely never a reason to give up one ounce of freedom for the sake of security. It won't work. There is no authority in the Constitution authorizing a central bank, which means there should be no Federal Reserve System. An idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any government. I've been in politics for 35 years. My cause has been the cause of liberty. In his heart and in his head, in his character and in his intellect, in what he has done and in what he will become, the Thomas Jefferson of our day, Ron Paul, is one of us. to win and get elected. I'm trying to change the course of history.